Hi, we have two guests as well as some munchkins. Uh, if I was unscrupulous, this would be a really good day to do course evaluations, but I will hold off on those until later. Okay? And yes, you can take stuff from here. You can take one of your cubes if you want or your stuff. Okay, so what I want to do today is I'm going to switch things up a little bit because we're going to try to go to the art museum on Wednesday. And so I want to do a little bit of the visual stuff today, and so I'm going to hold off on the final thing on the Laplace transform, you know, proving the inversion formula. So Laplace transform. And for those of you who are somewhat in that area, if I'm not in vision, please let me know. Okay? So we define the Laplace transform of f at s to be the integral from 0 to infinity of f of t e to the negative ts dt. And we talked last time about how this fits in the general form of an integral transform. And here, this is our kernel k of ts. And it takes us from a function of t to a function of s. What's the first question you have whenever you look at an integral like this? Does it converge? So as long as the real part of S is sufficiently large, it should converge. You have to what? Okay, go get, go to the water fountain. Doesn't matter if you step on the doesn't matter if you steps on the cables today. All right. So there's a lot of questions you can ask about the Laplace transform. The first is what is the inverse transform? And people often write this as you know, big F of S to denote that it is related to F. So I'm not going to go into that today. I was going to, but since I have my children here, and since we're going to the Art Museum on Wednesday, I want to do more complex dynamics and graphics today. Okay, two is what properties does L possess? So L is an operator. It takes functions to functions. What's the first property you would love it to have? Linear. linear. So it is linear. L of f plus g is L of f plus L of g. And in fact, more generally, I could even put an a and a b here and have an a and a b here. I'm killing half of the blackboard today to get ready to show you movies later, so I don't want to write the proof. Can someone tell me why it's linear? Oops, Kim, can't, you can't hit the camera. Okay. Why is this linear? So why is the Laplace transform a linear operator? It's the linearity of integral. It's the linearity of integral. So this is linearity of integration. Okay, now I'm still in focus. Excellent. So it inherits the linearity from integration. Okay? Nice job. Yes. Doesn't work. Can we take Kayla upstairs to get a glass of water? Uh, okay. Okay, thank you. So it inherits linearity from integration. Can you think of any other properties you would like to see? It would be nice to be able to it would be nice if it was continuous. So continuous in what sense? Of the, the variable s? Uh, yep. Or varying the function f? Oh, and then the function f. Right, so <laughs> this, is, and this is why you always have to ask, what do you mean? <coughs> I remember years ago there was a discussion, should we allow juniors to go to some colloquium and get credit? And we decided they could get up to five credits. And then at the end I just said, I, I'm sure this is probably obvious, but should those five credits count towards the senior colloquium prize? And everybody said it was obvious, and the department split 50-50 as to it does and it does not count. Always make sure people agree with you on your interpretations of a problem. So when you say, is it continuous with respect to S or with respect to F? Because there really are two inputs. One of them should be fairly easy. Which one's probably the easier one? S. Probably S, you know, that if we just change S by a little bit. And in fact, what do you hope would be true, at least for good F? What's your dream? What kind of function would this be? Excuse me. Don't use dirty words like differential in a complex analysis class. We don't want words like differentiable. We want words like holomorphic. 
which would be not only would be differentiable once, it would be differentiable infinitely often, it would have a Taylor series expansion. Okay? So the hope is that we would have something like that. And as long as f is sufficiently nice, this integral should be complex differentiable, and everything should be fine, at least for s in some range. So, um, so we'll call that point A, we'll call this point B, uh, maybe holomorphic in S for F nice. And I'll leave it to you to figure out what nice is. Any other properties we might want? And this is related to the colloquium Blake gave on Monday. Some relationship to the Fourier transform? Some relationship to the Fourier transform. Well, there's a really nice one yeah. in that uh, if S is equal to, say, I times Y, this is the Fourier transform, at least for functions supported on zero infinity. So there is a lot of connections between Laplace and Fourier. And a lot of it will come down to the decay. So if you take S to be pure imaginary, I need a lot of decay now in my function f for this integral to converge. Whereas I've got exponential decay here, as long as, say, the real part of S is positive. And then I can even survive polynomial growth in F. But when we did the uncertainty principle in Monday's lecture, what was one of the big things we had to do? And I'll put Ashman on the stand because you're a physicist. What are the two operators we have in physics for the uncertainty principle? In the physics uncertainty principle, what are the two items? Momentum and momentum <laughs> position. And how is momentum related as an operator to the position? It's the Fourier transform. It's, more, it's not just the Fourier transform. There's a derivative involved. Oh, yeah. Right? The position operator is through differentiation. So the question becomes, what does the Laplace transform do under differentiation? So let's investigate that now. So we'll call this point C. What is the Laplace transform of f prime? Let's assume all integrals are okay. So you can put in eventually you know, whatever conditions you need to make all this work. So we want to calculate the Laplace transform of f prime at s. This would be the integral from 0 to infinity of f prime of t e to the negative ts dt. Okay, how should we handle this? Integration by parts. We don't know that many things. We can integrate by parts. We can change variables. If we have a multiple integral, what can we do? <coughs> Flip, the order. Flip the order. That's essentially all we know. Uh, we do also have one thing that we learned new in this course. What's the new integration technique we learned in this course? Contour integrals. <coughs> And the way you actually do the inversion formula is through contour integration. And so I will probably do that maybe next Monday. All right, so let's let u be fairly obvious. I think we want u to be e to the minus ts and dv to be f prime of t dt because this has a prime already in it. It's not that hard to calculate the antiderivative of f prime, right? And the antiderivative of f prime is just f of t. What about the derivative of e to the ts? What would that be? Minus s. Good. E to the minus ds. Because we're doing everything with respect to the variable t. So now we would get the Laplace transform of f prime at s is u v minus the integral of v du, zero infinity, zero infinity. Well, when we look at uv at infinity, our function has to have enough decay so that things converge. Now, we have to be a little bit careful in that it is possible, maybe f is spiking on very, very small bands of exponentially small, or maybe Gaussianly small widths so that this integral could still converge. 
So if you take, here's the integer n. Take an interval of size 1 over n factorial um, to the n factorial. This will be an extremely small band. The function could be getting very large on this region, faster than e to the ts. We could have the function maybe get all the way up to maybe e to the n log n. But that will be so small, that will be large, but when you multiply it by this very small band, this is still going to be a finite number. And when I were to try to calculate the sum, the sum would still converge. So when we say that we have this integral converging, that convergence may not be enough. I strongly encourage you to make an argument like this precise and really go through the details. This is one of the biggest mistakes people make when they do real analysis. They assume because the integral exists, the function tends to zero at infinity. That is not the case. What it means is most of the time, the function is getting small. The measure of the set where the function is greater than epsilon has to go to zero. Otherwise, the integral would be getting larger and larger. And it's you know, supposed to be converging to something. So most of the time, it will become very small. But it can have very small bands where it gets large. So then how would we interpret uv at infinity? So we need to assume a little bit more about our function. It's not enough for this integral to converge, but we need f to maybe be going to 0 at infinity. OK. So if f goes to 0 at infinity, or even if f is bounded at infinity, we'd be OK. Or if f is going polynomially at infinity, we'd be OK. It's got to be enough so that the exponential decay here kicks in. All right, so the boundary term at infinity doesn't come into play. Now we have the value at 0. Now we've got e to the negative ts times v. So we get f of 0. When we plug in uh, 0 for t, we get 1. So we get negative f of 0. Now we have a minus v du. The minus and the minus we enforce. We have an s outside. And now we have an integral from 0 to infinity of e to the negative ts f of t. Oh, but what's this part over here? I'm sorry? It's the Laplace. Yeah, it's the Laplace transform. So we get the Laplace transform of f prime at s equals minus f of 0 plus s Laplace transform of f prime at s. And so this is one of the key relations of the Laplace transform. The Laplace transform of the derivative is nicely related to the Laplace transform of the original function. I think we, you just put Laplace at the Oh, sorry. Thank you. Yes. So we now have a wonderful, wonderful result. OK, now here's where things get a little bit interesting. We have this connection. Why stop at the first derivative? How would you calculate what the Laplace transform of f double prime is? Replace the s with f primes. Excellent. We can then just feed this formula in here. And so now that we have this, all we need to do is replace uh, f with f prime. Then we get the Laplace transform of f double prime is minus what? F prime. So let me do it slowly. Is it okay if I keep just using one part of the board? We could, of course, go back and do it directly and put in f double prime and integrate by parts twice. But we can just iterate. So the Laplace transform of f double prime at s would be minus f prime of 0 plus s times the Laplace transform of f prime of s. But we know what the Laplace transform of f prime is. It's just this. So we get it equals minus f prime of 0 plus uh, s times this quantity. So it becomes a minus s times f of 0. 
And now we'll have an S squared plus F <coughs> of S. And you can keep iterating. So a really good exercise, find the Laplace transform of the nth derivative at S. You should be able to do this by induction. You should be able to guess what the formula is without too much trouble. This gives you an idea of why we like the Laplace transform so much. Can somebody say in words what the Laplace transform is doing? It's converting differential derivatives to polynomials. Does this remind you of anything we might have seen in this class? Converting something to polynomials or something to series expansions. Where have we seen something like this? That's the trick in contrarian. Contrarian, exactly. So this is very similar to contour integration. So this reduces like differential equations to just yes. fractions. Though. Yes. Converts differentiation to polynomial algebra. So it's similar to the residue theorem. So the goal is to see how powerful complex analysis is. There's a reason you're taking this class. You know, it's either you want to see where math goes, or there's no heat in your elementary school, and you had to come to work with daddy today. <laughs> there's a reason you're here. Okay. We could actually use this to study the heat equation. But it's a little close to home today, so I think I will pass on the heat equation. <coughs> but this should give you an idea of the power of the Laplace transform. We can use this to solve differential equations. And it's going to convert differential equations to algebra for the Laplace transform of f, which we then solve. Unfortunately, what do we need to do after we solve for the Laplace transform of f? We need to go backwards. So, you know, so let's say you're given, say, f double prime of x, maybe 3 minus 2 f prime of x plus 8 f of x equals 4. Well, maybe we could have a more interesting thing. Maybe we could have g of x over here. We could take the Laplace transform of both sides. We would get a polynomial in S And I think we always keep the Laplace transform to the first power. Let me just quickly double check. Um, yep, we always keep the Laplace transform to the first power. Polynomial in S, and then Laplace transform of F equals the you know, Laplace transform of G. We solve for the Laplace transform of F as the Laplace transform of G minus the polynomial divided by the coefficient, and then invert. So you get Laplace transform of F equals Laplace transform of g minus polynomial divided by coefficient. And now, this is where life is hard. You have to invert. How do you think people invert? Yes? What do you want to do? What do you want to do? Oh, they don't look like g's? Which, this doesn't look like, oh, this one doesn't look like a g? Yeah. All right, let's go. Would you like to write the G? I would. I would. Kayla's gonna write. Kayla's gonna fix all the G's. Excellent. <laughs> the other G's need to be fixed. It looks better, Dad. Oh, you want to fix that G? I do. I hear Kayla. Look, Kim, you fix one. Look, Kim, and the other, so we don't get into a fight. <laughs> and if anybody else from class wants to fix a G, let me. Kayla, walk carefully. There's a chance it could actually stop working again. Yeah. All right, so we now have to invert this. How do you think we would invert the Laplace transform? Uh, 
probably a similar formula. So there's a similar formula to this. Basically, there's a 1 over 2 pi i that's coming from the residue theorem. And instead of an e to the positive, it's in, I'm sorry, instead of an e to the negative, it's an e to the positive. And so we'll talk about the inverse Laplace transform on next Monday. But the idea is simple. You invert at the end because it's more convenient to work on this related problem because this is an algebra problem. And as you said, partial fractions up the wazoo, you know, that's a great thing that's going to be coming in here. It comes down to how do we handle the inversion. One thing is to actually just have a table of Laplace transforms and their inversions. And then you can just notice, hey, this is the same as the following, so its inverse must be this. What would you need for that to be true? Uniqueness. You would need uniqueness. And this comes back to the issue we had with the central limit theorem. Life is, I'm sorry, <laughs> life is wonderful when things are unique, right? Sometimes it's good not to be unique. You know, I have two kids here today. They were two poorly written Gs. Good, each kid got one G. <laughs> wonderful. But in general, you like things to be unique, right? Yes? <laughs> Those G's looked like nines. <laughs> As an aside, when I was taking my general exam at Princeton, at one point I was doing um, modules and Jordan canonical form, and one of the professors was having trouble reading my number. He could not read my seven. He thought my seven was a greater than sign. So I remember writing E. <laughs> and, that, and what is that equal to? Roman numerals for seven. Well, what's the whole expression? What is it? E to the 7x. E to the 7x. But it can't be e to the 17 because the x is over there. <laughs> Wait, what? I wanted to write e raised to the 7x, but one of my professors thought my 7 looked like a greater than sign. So I wrote, I might have actually written it like this to make it clear. <laughs> I can't remember. It was many years ago. But this shows you why we care so much about these uniqueness theorems. And then, of course, the question becomes, what if I have the product of two functions? What's the Laplace transform of a product? Is there a nice formula for the Laplace transform of a product? So I don't want to get into too much differential equations here. I want to give enough so that if you're interested, if you want to do some problems, happy to let you do some. Uh, you know, again, there's going to be one more homework assignment. If you want to trade problems, that's fine. This is a great exercise to do. I know the end of the semester is very busy. You guys worked hard in the beginning of the semester. So for those of you who are just visiting for the day, who slacked. <laughs> but the difficulty is finding the inverse. OK. Any other questions on the Laplace transform? So we'll do a little bit more on Monday. But I hope this just gives you a sense that what we saw with the residue theorem is not an <laughs> Almost. Almost. <laughs> Almost. You get half. You get half credit. <laughs> so I did break the cup, so I think I lose a little bit there. <laughs> <laughs> and, got and I got water on his feet. So yes. <laughs> you gotta be careful. You can't hit the. the <laughs> you guys are hitting the, the camera. Okay. Um, so this finishes off our stuff on the Laplace transform. It's similar to the residue theorem. It's one of the main themes in complex analysis. Integration is high. Solving differential equations is hard. Solving polynomial problems is relatively easy. Okay? Interestingly, this is now a great opportunity to segue into solving polynomial equations. <laughs> so the only difference between what I was going to do is I'm actually going to do make sure I get through all the polynomial equations today, not the Laplace transform. But these topics fit beautifully. Solving polynomial equations. So I know some of you have had operations research with me and have seen this. For those of you, I apologize. Some of you may have seen this in another class with me. How many of you are familiar with Newton's method? OK. This is basically what made me a mathematician. I remember I was in a sophomore analysis class. We were using baby Wooden. It was exercises 3.16, 3.17, 3.18. I do remember. And 3.16 and 3.18 were Newton's method to solve for p roots. 316 was square roots, 318 was in general. 317 was an inferior method to Newton, which did not work nearly as well. And so what I want to do is I want to explain a little bit of Newton's method, 
and talk about how this has applications in complex analysis. All right, so we're going to start Newton's method versus divide and conquer. I'll quickly do divide and conquer. I'm going to sound very negative on divide and conquer for good reasons. Newton's method is far superior when applicable. Divide and conquer works in much greater generality. So the way divide and conquer works is assume f is continuous, we want to solve f of x equals 0. And of course, we always live in the interval 0, 1. Let's assume f is positive here and f is negative here. I want to see if Cam can get this. Cam? No. Our function <laughs> is positive over here and it's negative over here. I don't want it. You don't want it? Okay, you want to try it? It's worth a munchkin. Don't know. Fine. If your function is positive over here and negative over here, what must happen somewhere between these two points? A zero there? Yeah, you get a munchkin. You just got the intermediate value there. <laughs> <laughs> this was not planted. I'll give you a question later, okay? <laughs> okay, so this was not planned, but this shows you just how intuitive either the intermediate value theorem is or how motivating a munchkin is. <laughs> if you're positive here and negative here, there has to be a zero in between. Do you agree, Kayla? You know, we start up high, we end low, we've got to go through here. Because this is in Star Trek, we don't have transports. I'm, I'm wearing this because I've given my baseball lecture in probability. Alright, so let's assume we check at the halfway point, and let's assume the function is positive here. Does there have to be a zero kill between two positives? Between two highs? No. Does there have to be a zero between a positive and a negative? Yeah. You get a munch one. Dad, there can't be a zero in between two positives. There could. What if I go like this? Then there could, but... <laughs> then there could. <laughs> How many zeros must there be between two positives? At least two. At least two. Can I get another? <laughs> I answered a question. All right. Could there be three? You have to uh, answer this question. No. Why not? Because you would have to go down and then up, and so it's basically counting by twos. <laughs> Damn, that's worth two months. <laughs> <laughs> so we know that there's got to be an even number between two positives. Wow. I mean, I never realized how intuitive the intermediate value is. <laughs> and boy, was this the day to do evaluations, because I could pick them and kill them all. Okay, so it's positive here, it's negative here, let's say it's positive here. We divide in half again. Let's say it's negative. Now we must there be a zero. Between. Between Cameron and Kayla? <laughs> Between one half. And we keep so every time we divide, we half the error. Divide and half the error. So ten iterations reduces by 1 over 2 to the 10, which is approximately 1 over 1,000. Because 2 to the 10 is 1,000. So what that means is every time you do this 10 times gives you basically three decimal digits. It's not great. This is the slow and steady algorithm. about this algorithm? The conditions are pretty weak. Weak conditions only need continuity. There's something else that's nice about this. So in addition to only needing continuity, you can easily bound the error. You can easily bound the error, but it's something a little bit better than easily bounding the error. Not really from a math standpoint, but it'd be easy to code. Maybe it's easy to code, easy to check. You just have to see positive or negative. You don't even need how much. 
easy to check. You only need sign. So these are positives of divide and conquer. The negative is it takes 10 iterations to get three digits accuracy, another 10 to get three more. So to get six digits, you've got to do this 20 times. We do use this in certain situations. For the Riemann zeta function, this is still one of the best ways we have for finding zeros of the Riemann zeta function in a critical line. We have a function that's very similar to the Riemann zeta function. And that function is real valued, and it has the same absolute value as the Riemann zeta function on the critical line. So if it's zero, the Riemann zeta function is zero. And so all we have to do is we have to look for sign changes. And by using complex analysis, we can count how many zeros there should be in a box. So if all the zeros lie on the line, we verify the Riemann hypothesis in that region. So divide and conquer, for all that I'm going to attack it later, is useful and good for things. All right. However, if you had a list of top five mathematicians of all time, who would definitely be on that list? <laughs> yes, well, it would be on, but who else? Newton. No Right? <laughs> you know, you can't go an entire math class, especially at this level, without talking about something from Newton. So his idea was the following. Let's say you want to solve f of x is x squared minus 3. And let's start off with a really bad guess. Taylor? Yeah. Can you give me a number that multiplies by itself to something close to 3? What times itself is close to 3? 2. Thank you. What's 2 times 2? You can have another munch here. All right, so we took a guess from somebody in the first grade for the square root of three as two, okay? This turns out to be such a good lecture to have Cam and Kayla here. Um, right. one and a half times uh, two would be. But I want to use the same number, I want x squared. I want a number that's squared. So I want to solve f of x, which is x squared minus three equals zero. And of course, we know what the answer is. The answer is the square root of 3. So here's what Newton's method does. Here's the function f of x. Here's my initial guess. x naught equals 2. And what we do is this point is going to be x naught, f of x naught. And what does calculus teach us to do at a point? Like an L. Looks more like a W now. It's been a while since I've been in a penmanship class. <laughs> what do we do in calculus when we have a point and we're trying to understand a function? Take a derivative. Take a derivative. And so we're going to draw the tangent line. And so this is going to be f prime. Yeah, it'll be f prime of x naught will be the slope. And then we construct the tangent line. And so we get y minus y naught, which is just f of x naught, equals f prime of x naught, x minus x naught. And we can find the intercept. How do we find the intercept? Let's say y equal to 0. What should we call that intercept? X1. X1. And so you get 0 minus f of x naught equals f prime of x naught x1 minus x naught. So if we solve, we get negative f of x naught over f prime of x naught. And then we add x naught. And that would be x1. Algebra mistakes? However, once we have x1, what do we do? Yeah, now that we repeat. And then we would take this as our x1, we would come up here, and we would draw the and we would iterate. 
And so, can somebody give me a general formula for x n plus 1? x n plus 1 would just be? Place the zeros with n. Place the zeros with n. <laughs> right? This is why I did the algebra in great generality. And so, this would be x n. Now, f of x n is just going to be x n squared minus 3 and f prime of xn is going to be 2 of xn. So when you see something like this, what do you want to do? What would you want to do with this expression? on Cam and Kale, it's like seventh grade algebra. What do you do when you have two expressions like this? Combine them. Combine right? <laughs> Multiply by 2xn over 2xn, so you'll get a 1 half. We'll get an xn squared. <coughs> okay, a 2xn squared minus xn squared becomes xn squared, but we're dividing by xn, so it becomes just xn. And then minus, a minus becomes a plus 3 over xn. So this becomes a really nice formula to iterate to find square roots of 3. Let's think about it. If xn happens to be the square root of 3, what does this expression equal? Square root of 3, if you include the division by half. It's basically averaging uh, xn and 3 divided by xn. This is going to converge to the square root of 3 extremely rapidly. So. on the wrong number here. Okay, good. Oh, I don't need to keep this plugged in anymore, so that makes it a little bit easier. Alright. Alright, is it in focus? Yeah. Okay. So now, all we need to do is, let's let um, f of n be one half for n equals one and less than equal to by n plus plus. Just embracing the code. What's our initial guess going to be? So I'll start with be two. So nu is going to be one half, and then so it should be current plus three divided by current. Right? You just go current. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you. And that should give it, yes? Can you shift the screen over just a little? I'm sorry? Can you shift the <coughs> radio over just a little bit? To the left oh, side. Oh, sure. Of the I think so. Okay. Right. So now what we can do is we can print uh, new, and then we'll print 1.0 times new, we'll print set. Accuracy uh, square root of 3.0. Let's do 15 digits. And now what we need to do is current is new. We'll put in some spaces just so it's a little bit easier to see. So our first guess becomes 7 fourths, 1.75, which is not so bad from. Still see? Mm -hmm. Okay, I just want to increase the size. Okay. 
So our second guess is 9756, 1.7321, 1.7320. Our third guess, and again, we're always getting rationals for our guess. 1.73205, so at this point, we're no longer giving enough details. Set accuracy, new 15. Yes, it does. All right, so for the next one, it's 1.73205081050807. 1 the next one, 08075080756888. So at this point, with 15 digits, I'm not doing enough to see the difference. Yeah. That's okay, we can bump it up to 20. But the point is, uh, okay, now 20, we've seen it's 88778877192. <laughs> so you see how much better Newton's method is. There's a reason why he's considered one of the gods of mathematics. Okay? This method is phenomenal in terms of how well it works. Okay? Newton's method is terrific. Basically, you can prove every time you iterate, you double the number of decimal digits you get. This is far superior to the divide and conquer. What is the disadvantage of Newton's method? Function has to be differentiable. Now, there's some other issues with Newton's method. So here it's movie time. So here is a nice fractal. <laughs> and of course, th there's a law that whenever you do these, you have to have cheesy music. <laughs> Anybody know which fractal this is? It's a Newton fractal. Anybody know which one? So we're solving for the roots of x cubed minus 1 equals 0. And we're applying Newton's method to see which root you converge to. So the roots will be three roots of unity. And you have the centers on the red, green, and yellow regimes. And this is color coded so that if you start at a different point in the plane and you apply Newton's method, it colors you based on which root you converge to. And this is where the fractalness happens, is that if you move ever so slightly away, you can change greatly what root you converge to. You shouldn't have this much of a change. There is an enormous wealth of stuff in complex analysis in fractals. Uh, not so much in the cheesy music behind things, so we'll the cheesy music. But you can see some fascinating behavior happening there. So there's a lot more you can do with fractals. What's the most famous fractal? The, the Mandelbrot. The, no, not the Kenzo, I'd say the Mandelbrot. <laughs> and so this is zooming in on the Mandelbrot set to the level of 10 to the 275. So we'll start with the cheesy music and the walk <laughs> You know, I feel like this is like an 80s remix. And then it's going to start spinning, I think, like it's on drugs, yes. <laughs> you know, this is just for show, and then we're going to start the zoom in. So we'll stop the cheesy music now. And so, I'm not going to go into too much detail as to what Mandelbrot set is, but it's again, you have a very simple complex map that you're iterating. And you color things one way if they stay bounded as you iterate, and you color them something else if they diverge. And then the color indicates how rapidly it diverges. And so right now it's zooming, 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 zooming. And then I mean, it's I, I'm going to jump ahead towards the end. <laughs> you, uh, the links are there. The links are there, so you can see this all later, guys. This is what I get to do with my days. And remember that set we started with all the way in the beginning. You will give me good events. This is like the time for subliminal messages. <laughs> but we're still zooming in, zooming in, zooming in, zooming in, <laughs> zooming in. Oh, what's that? What's that? How we started with? It's where we started. It's a remarkable <laughs> self-similarity. All right, we have three minutes left. That's just enough time. And for this, we will have the volume on. Now, I did promise, you know, I dressed up for my... Uh, probability class, I will, of course, also dress up for this class. So who knows what movie this is? Yeah, this is not what the munchkin count. <laughs> what movie? One of the college students. I, Taylor. Taylor. 
Which one? Wrath, the second Wrath The second one, Wrath of Khan. This is one of the first examples of fractals in movies. When you think about all the movie special effects, what they do is they create what's called the Genesis Torpedo, which can convert like a lifeless moon into something nice. The device is delivered, instantaneously causing what we call the Genesis effect. Matter is reorganized. So you're about to see where the fractals come in. So right now this is not fractals, this is just like big wave of explosion. <laughs> of and when you start looking at the coastlines, this is where the fractals come in. There's some great stuff, you know, what is the length of the British coast? And so, you know, this is a really brief introduction to complex dynamics. There is a lot more that can be done. What I want to be doing, you know, for the end of the semester is just giving you guys a sense of what's out there. It starts with something very simple like Newton's method. We iterate, and as we keep iterating, we get some stuff. Yes? So, just a quick question. If we yeah. had some sort of modified, like, uh, run the cut of Newton's method where we include other terms or hydrogen, yes. so we even even better? I believe so. And so right now what we're doing is we're using a linear approximation. Right. If we try to use the best parabola, because we can actually solve parabolas using the quadratic formula. And then you could write down what would be the formula, and how quickly would that converge? What's the additional complexity? Right. What's nice about this is you always have rational numbers. If you go to something more involved, you may not always have rational numbers. But outstanding question to do, a great homework problem would be to replace one of the problems I asked you with what would be the quadratic Newton's method. And what would be the convergence issues? So, you know, you want to know at the end of the day, does this converge to your root? Okay, so thank you all for coming today. The videos will be online, and hopefully they recorded.